everybody. J.K. Rowling has come out with a new series of books. Now, you may remember J.K. Rowling from writing the Harry Potter series, but after she finished that, she decided to come out with a new series, and this is the first one called the Ichabog. So we're going to read the first chapter of the Ichabog today, and then that may give you an idea of, hey, here's another series by J.K. Rowling that I'm going to be interested in. So let me get my glasses on. And this is chapter one, King Fred the Fearless. Once upon a time, there was a tiny country called Cornucopia, which had been ruled for centuries by a long line of fair-haired kings, which means light blonde or light color hair. The king at the time of which I write was called King Fred the Fearless. He denounced the fearless bit himself on the morning of his coronation, partly because it sounded nice with Fred, but also because he'd once managed to kill a wasp all by himself, if you didn't count the five footmen and the boot boy that also helped. King Fred the Fearless came to the throne on a huge wave of popularity. He had lovely yellow curls and a fine mustache, and he looked fantastic in his velvet clothes, which all the rich men wore during that time. Fred was said to be generous, smiled, and waved when everyone caught sight of him, and he looked awfully handsome in his portraits that were given to everyone in the kingdom so they could hang them on their walls and always see him. The people of Cornucopia were most happy with their new king, and many thought he'd end up doing even a better job than his father, who was Richard the Righteous, whose teeth, though nobody, nobody had mentioned it at the time, had been rather crooked. King Fred was secretly relieved to find out how easy it was to rule a cornucopia. In fact, the country just seemed to run itself. Nearly everybody had lots of food. The merchants made pots of gold. Fred's advisors took care of any little problem that rose. All that was left for Fred to do was just smile at his subjects whenever he went out in his carriage and go hunting five times a week with his two best friends, L Lord Spittleworth and Lord Flapoon. Spittleworth and Flapoon had large estates of their own in the country, but they found it much cheaper and more amusing to live at the palace with the king and eat his food, hunt his deer, and make sure the king didn't get too fond of any of the beautiful ladies at court. They had no wish to see Fred married because a queen might spoil all their fun. And for a time, Fred had seemed to rather like Lady Eslada, who was had dark hair and was beautiful. But Spittleworth had persuaded Fred that she was far too serious, and she was bookish too. And there was no way the country would love her as queen. Fred didn't know that Lord Spittleworth had a grudge against Lady Eslada. He'd once asked her to marry him, and she'd turned him down. Lord Spittleworth was very thin and clever, and his friend, Flapoon, was kind of red-faced and enormous, and it required six men to lift him up onto his massive horse. Though not as clever as Spittleworth, Flapoon was still far sharper than the king. Both lords were experts at flattery and pretended to be astonished by how good Fred was at everything from riding to playing games. If Spittleworth had a particular talent, it was persuading the king to do things that suited Spittleworth. And if Flapoon had a gift, it was for convincing the king that no one on earth was as loyal to the king as his two best friends. Fred thought Spittleworth and Flapoon were jolly good old chaps, and they urged him to hold fancy parties and elaborate picnics and sumptuous banquets because Cornucopia was famous far beyond its borders for its food. Each of its cities was known for a different kind of food, and each was the very best in the world. The capital of Cornucopia, or Shuville, laid in the south of the country and was surrounded by acres of orchards and fields of golden wheat and emerald green grass on which pure white dairy cows grazed and the cream, flour, and fruit produced by the farmers here was then given to the exceptional bakers of Shuville who made 
fantastic pastries. Think, if you please, of the most delicious cake or cookie you have ever tasted. Well, let me tell you, then you'd have been downright ashamed to serve that in Shoeville unless a grown man's eyes filled with tears when he bit into the pastry it was deemed a failure and never made again. The bakery windows were piled high with delicacies such as maiden's dreams and fairies' cradles and hopes of heaven, which were so exquisitely and painfully delicious that they were saved only for special occasions, and everyone cried for joy when they ate them. To the north of Shoeville lay more green fields and clear sparkling rivers where jet black cows and happy pink pigs were raised. They were sent to Kurdsburg and Baronstown. Kurdsburg was famous for its cheeses and Baronstown was celebrated for its smoked sausage and honey roasted hams. The savory fumes rising from the chimneys of the red brick Baronstown stoves were Wonderful. A few hours north of Kurdsburg and Baronstown, you came upon acres of vineyards with grapes as large as eggs, and each of them ripe and sweet and juicy. And a little north of Jeroboam, a strange thing happened. It was as though the magically rich land of Cornucopia had exhausted itself by producing the best grass and the best fruit and the best wheat in the world. Right at the northern tip came a place known as the marshlands, and the only thing that grew there were some tasteless, rubbery mushrooms and some thin, dry grass that was only good enough to feed a few very sickly-looking sheep. The marshlanders who tended the sheep didn't have the sleek, well-rounded, well-dressed appearance of all the other people who lived in Jeroboam, Baronstown, Kurdsville, or Shoeville. They were thin and ragged, and the poorly nourished sheep never got good prices. The most common dish in the marshlands was a greasy soup made of the sheep that were just too old to sell. The rest of Cornucopia found the marshlanders as dirty and ill-tempered. They had rough voices which the other Cornucopians imitated, making them sound like old sheep and jokes were made about their manners and their simplicity, and as far as the rest of Cornucopia was concerned, the only memorable thing that had ever come out of the marshlands was the legend of the Ichabod. So there's chapter one. It sounds like a country, Cornucopia, that has awesome things in it, great places, except for one place, the marshlands, which seems kind of dreary and and not really a great place to live, but where the Ichabod story came from. So if you're interested in this book, it's available not only in the Williams Library, but it's also available online using your CALS tech card. If you need help using your CALS tech card, or you don't have one, just get in touch with me, and I'll make sure to set you up. Have a great week, and remember, keep reading.